There are those who say the F-A-22 Raptor may be the last fighter to need a pilot. For some time now, planes have been able to fly with little help from human hands. The Raptor controls most facets of its mission on its own. But for the present, at least, it is through men like Jim Hecker and his fellow pilots that air supremacy is maintained. It is through them that Langley's long tradition of combat air power will be kept alive. The fighter squadrons here are America's first. They date back to World War I and the very beginnings of military aviation. From these planes, we can trace the history through a series of bold technological leaps all the way from the box kite to the stealth bomber. By creating and filling one role after another, planes transformed warfare, slowly evolving into the Air Force they are today. The F-22 Raptor is at the front line of that force. The value of such an asset is now obvious. Not so in 1903 at least not to the United States Army. Following their historic flight at Kitty Hawk, Orville and Wilbur Wright faced unexpected indifference from the military. But the U.S. government wasn't interested. In 1903, there was no threat of war, and no one was planning ahead. So the brothers bided their time, confident other parties would recognize the potential. While the Wrights sat on their invention, the idea of powered flight was taking off throughout the Western world. France led the way. But even though the brothers were giving other inventors time to catch up, they carefully kept their most important innovations to themselves. Their feat remained more legend than fact. The French, by this point, had done a few things you could barely call flights, I mean, pops in a straight line, uh, a little bit more, but when Wilbur finally shows up and flies and does circles and figure eights, the French were just astonished. Still, by 1908, the world was awash with aviation pioneers, all believing they were the ones who would come up with the crucial pieces of the aeronautical puzzle. Yet the Wrights shocked everyone when they arrived in France to show off their plane. Their performance proved they were still far ahead of any competitors. What they knew was how to control a plane once airborne. Wilbur Wright had hit on the idea of twisting the wings to steer his course through the air. It is a means of control still used to this day. Becoming airborne had been a challenge but staying airborne was a singular triumph. And in 1908, the Wrights were still the only ones who could take control of the sky. In 1909, the United States Army took delivery of a Wright Flyer, the world's first warplane. Louis Blériot, a French pilot, touched down in Dover, England on July 25, 1909. He barely made it across the channel in his flimsy homemade aircraft. His 25-horsepower engine was only just sufficient for the journey. But his success was a wake-up call for England. It took little imagination to see what threat a more powerful craft could pose to the island nation. The military powers of Europe also saw the potential and quickly embraced the technological challenge of creating an efficient, lightweight airplane engine. The heavy, water-cooled engines just weren't practical for flying. But there was an imaginative alternative. In 1909, some enterprising French engineers began adapting lighter, self-cooling rotary engines. The first rotary airplane engine was so small and comparatively light, it was christened the Gnome. 
At 50 horsepower, the Gnome rotary engine answered the French Army's immediate needs. It was light enough for the early aircraft to take off with, and powerful enough to cover the distances required for basic reconnaissance. With a massive 150 horsepower engine and a body weight half that of its contemporaries, the Camel was a powerful and agile combatant. By 1914, the rotary engine had become so popular it was being manufactured under license in France, Britain, and Germany. It was then that the career of the warplane truly took off. On August 1st, 1914, Germany invaded France. And Europe was at war. On September 2nd, a lone French aircraft spotted masses of hostile German troops east of Paris and alerted the French generals. The Battle of the Marne ensued. And with planes watching overhead, each side hunkered into the deep, distinctive trenches that would become iconic of the First World War. In addition to reconnaissance of enemy movements, the planes also took on the role of artillery spotting. This was equally dangerous and equally vital. What they would do is fire one in the general direction of the target and let an aerial spotter using Morse code sending corrections back to the battery. The airplane was the artillery's eyes. At Neuve Chapelle, the nature of warfare changed forever. The eye in the sky had brought a third dimension to the battlefield. And for the commanders on both sides, there was now a new challenge, to blind the enemy. The fighter was developed in order to accompany an observing aeroplane, so the roles of the two aircraft did split. The Lewis gun was generally used as a flexible gun on a scarf ring behind the pilot. Sometimes they were fitted on the top wing, um, right above the propeller arc, but they were awkward to get at, and that really didn't work very well. The gunner effectively had to stand up, aim the gun at the aeroplane in front, and of course clear the blockages that happened with the gun. So this was all going on in a kind of a 50 mile an hour gale. What you wanted to do is to actually fly the aeroplane at your target. Of course the problem was that you couldn't fire the gun through the propeller for obvious reasons because you shoot the propeller off. The birth of the fighter plane occurs in the mind of a pre-war French aviator, Roland Garo, an intensely patriotic Frenchman uh, who didn't like the idea of his country having been invaded by the Germans. And he took it upon himself to find a way uh, to seek revenge in the air. Garo's got his mechanic to attach metal plates to the back of a propeller precisely in the firing line of a machine gun that would be rigidly fixed to his plane. When the gun fired, if you were lucky, the bullet went through the propeller disc without hitting the propeller, and if it didn't, it hit the deflector plate and got deflected out of the way. Garrus's solution was crude, but it worked. Garo just scared the fool out of the Germans. He shot down a number of aircraft with this strange technique because he's turned the airplane into a flying gun. In a little over two weeks, Garo shot down three German planes. Then his luck ran out. On April 18, 1915, he was struck by ground fire. He crash landed behind enemy lines with his secret weapon intact. Fokker, a Dutchman building planes for the Germans, took Garros' innovation one step further. He synchronized the firing of the gun to the propeller. Every time the 
propeller went past, the gun would fire, the other propeller would go by, the f and it would fire through the propeller with no problems. It was called interrupter gear. Many derivative systems followed Fokkers. With Fokkers interrupter gear, the Germans won the race for the world's first fighter. Called the Fokker E-1, it was a monoplane nicknamed the Eindecker. Throughout the summer of 1915, it created havoc in the skies above northern France. The period was known as the Fokker Scourge. In the so-called Fokker Scourge, they make it very difficult for the French and the British to conduct aerial reconnaissance. It proved very, very effective, and they completely dominated warfare for a few weeks or months until our own system had been developed. Fortunately for the Allies, they didn't have to wait long until their own designs challenged those of the Germans. The Eindecker had the initial advantage of the interrupter mechanism gun, but other than that, it was not a good plane. The Eindecker's reign was over in weeks, but the forward-firing machine gun was here to stay. It was easily fitted to increasingly formidable planes. An aeroplane could go from a sketch into a flying machine within about three months. And it wasn't just the planes that were being turned out quickly. With the war raging, pilot training was condensed into a few short weeks. Novices were thrown in disguise that were becoming ever more treacherous. Oswald Belke, the preeminent German fighter tactician, came up with the first real codified rules of aerial combat. Instructed his pilot to fly grouped with mutual protection, with a lot of speed, with the position of the sun in the back. Never engage in combat until you've secured every possible advantage. Come in by surprise, make your shots and get out shoot a very close range and go away, whatever you achieve. A new age was at hand, the age of the fighter ace, a concept of war not seen since the Middle Ages. These were the knights of the sky locked in mortal combat. Every nation had its champions, and for every champion, the nations kept score. The aces, especially the Germans, had clout. They could go into the factories and weapons depots and demand changes. Their need for faster, more powerful planes drove aircraft design forward. Von Richthofen himself had a hand in the development of a new triplane from Fokker. Georges Guinemer, the French ace, had his own plane modified to fit his favorite gun. This was a new concept in warplane design, custom-built to meet the requirements of the job and the demands of the aviator. 1916 to 1917 saw some of the classic fighters appear on the Western Front, each striving to outperform the other. One plane that would have its weeks of glory was another favorite of von Richthofen's. It arrived in the spring of 1917, and was directly responsible for a time history remembers as Bloody April. The Albatross D-1, quickly followed by the D-2 and the D-3, but they're solidly built, highly maneuverable. The Germans had the advantage of having excellent uh, inline liquid-cooled engines, water-cooled in those days, uh, produced by Benz and BMW. They've got enough power that they can carry not one, but two synchronized Maxim machine guns firing through the propeller. And, and that extra increment of firepower really made the Albatross a world beater. It was made from plywood in what is known as a monocoque construction, where the rigidity is in the shell. This eliminated the need for internal bracing. More space and better aerodynamics. A new word in 1917.
by the spring of 1917, fighter on fighter mass combats are a reality of war in the air, and they're a necessity for war on the ground. The German Flying Corps is well equipped with Albatross fighters, and they are able to take huge hunks out of the Royal Flying Corps. It's called Bloody April for, for good reason. The skies above northern France were witness to a new apocalyptic vision as wave after wave of fighters battled for aerial supremacy. Reconnaissance, artillery spotting, and aerial combat had all found their places. But there was one potential role that had yet to be realized, bombing. Since before the war had started, military minds had been obsessed with the possibilities, but thwarted by the technology. They started off by dropping uh, literally artillery shells with fins on the end. That's how it all started. The pilot and observer in the observing aeroplane thought, would it be good if we could just drop a shell directly onto the enemy below? That was developed into bombs. Of course, they got heavier, and hoiking them out of the aircraft and dropping them over the side was no longer a practical proposition. On the Western Front in 1914, there were no planes big or powerful enough to carry heavy bomb loads. But they themselves did not develop their own big bomber until much later in the war, when they canceled production of the hugely expensive Zeppelins and developed the twin-engine Gotha bombers instead. The design was based in part on Sikorsky's plane. In 1917, a new threat emerges with the Gotha. These are heavy engine for the time bombers who could carry a decent payload of bombs in, in the sense of it was worth dropping, it was going to do some damage. The most effective raid was June the 13th, 1917, when they actually did hit London hard. The real damage they were doing was in nuisance value. You have to switch the lights up, you have to switch the factories down, you close down the furnaces, that's not good for them. It all causes disruption. You don't stop transport, but you disrupt it. And in the end, what they were achieving was to be a bloody nuisance. A nuisance, yes. But the June 13th raid also killed 162 Londoners and wounded more than 432 others. The casualties created shockwaves throughout the establishment. Without knowing it, the Germans had set in motion a progression that would change the very nature of warfare. By highlighting the need for home defense, the raids prompted Britain to form the world's first independent air force. From then on, the RAF would be autonomous, operating alongside the army instead of within it. The change would be a momentous one and would set the course for all future military campaigns. Only through a comprehensive and versatile use of the airplane in all its roles could one nation hoped to prevail against another. Land power and sea power would no longer be enough. In four years, the airplane had grown from an unarmed, underpowered scouting machine, distrusted by its own commanders, into a primary weapon so valuable and so versatile, it merited its own command. The Great War had taken the airplane and turned it into a warrior. With the arrival of the bomber, the air armada was now complete. World War I had seen the emergence of the world's first integrated air force, created for reconnaissance, ground support, aerial combat, and bombing. But the end of the war did not mean the end of aerial progress. Only the first fledgling steps had been taken, and it would require many more advances and many more wars before the warplane would truly establish the age of air power.
thick-winged monoplane would allow man to do far more in the sky than anyone had ever expected. But in the 1920s, with the world at peace, it was not great nations' militaries that would immediately reap the benefits. The first action the new monoplane saw came at highly publicized worldwide races for the coveted Schneider Trophy, the holy grail of air racing. These planes were the NASCAR speedsters of their day. The Schneider Trophy during the 1920s and the early 30s pushed aerodynamics, propulsion, streamlining especially, to get the airplanes to fly faster. It was at international competitions like these that the warplanes of the future were being forged. Italy, America, and France all took turns at the top, sometimes doubling the speed record from the previous year. Even without a war to drive it, technology was progressing rapidly. By the end of the First World War, aircraft speeds might have been at a maximum 140 miles an hour. By the early 30s, speeds had trebled. According to the rules of the competition, the first nation to win three races within a five-year span would get to keep the Schneider Trophy forever. It happened in 1931, when a brilliant young British designer named R.J. Mitchell won three races in succession with his Supermarine Racer. Mitchell, chief aircraft designer for the Supermarine Company, was building civilian racers because in a time of grave recession and no looming threat of war, the British government was not putting much money into aviation. But his prowess with the racers was not overlooked. And within five years, he had built on his civilian success and created one of the greatest fighter planes of all time, the legendary Mark I Spitfire. And it could do a lot more than just fly. Housing eight 30 caliber machine guns and later four 20 millimeter cannons, the Spitfire was well named. A piece of technology ahead of its time. It was ready for war. It wouldn't have long to wait. In 1939, the ferocity of Hitler's attack caught Europe unprepared. The sheer speed of the Nazi advance, undertaken with a lethal combination of air and land forces, left country after country in disarray. This world war looked nothing like the last. Using radios, his warplanes, tanks, and infantry divisions were in constant communication. His commanders worked together to roll out a fast-moving wave of terror. The system was called Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War. Hitler's unstoppable forces racked up victory after victory until all that stood between them and the total conquest of Europe was a strip of water a little over 20 miles wide. On the other side lay England. The Nazi warplanes didn't take long to breach the channel and continue their aggressive advance. But the British were expecting them and had been preparing for just such an assault. For decades, they had been quietly building an invisible wall of defense to guard their island nation from aerial attacks. The result was a wall of protection five miles high and 600 miles long. It was a system that had been in the works since the very first airplane crossed the English Channel in 1909. The original Observer Corps was Britain's eyes, but it could see only as far as the horizon. So in the 20s, they added ears. What we've got here, what we're looking at, is an early warning detection system 
using acoustic methods to pick up the sound of aircraft engines. An operator sat in that little chamber, which was underground then, nice and silenced, and he listened to the point of loudest focus. When he found that place, of course, he could read off the bearings from which the sounds are coming on his equipment. Then they were passed to a central control room. The system was somewhat effective. On a quiet night, airplane engines could be heard up to 20 miles away. Plans exist for a chain of these mirrors all around the southeast coast of England. They were going to have one of these big mirrors about every 25 miles, and then in the gaps between, one of the round mirrors. This expansion made sense in the 20s when planes flew slow enough to make the 20-mile range effective. But by the 1930s, they were reaching speeds of over 300 miles an hour. That meant the warning was only 10 minutes, not enough time to scramble a counterattack. Radar is not a British invention. Radar was, in fact, invented in eight different countries during the 1930s. But because in each of these countries it was a military secret, no one knew that the other country was working on radar. But at that time, Britain had the greatest need for the technology. So they rushed it into service as the final piece of their interlocking air defense system. It was up and running by 1940, ready for Hitler's aerial assault. The German Luftwaffe was in for a surprise as it set out to conquer England from the sky. For German scientists and engineers, they assumed more or less that they must be ahead of the British when it came to radar technology. But in fact, their radar technology was being used in a much more primitive way for air defense. They misunderstood the nature of the carefully controlled network which the British had set up. Britain's defense system was codenamed Chain Home. It was comprised of a string of radar stations equipped with overlapping transmitters. Each transmitter had a receiver that could detect aircraft up to 200 miles away. From the radar stations, operators were connected by landlines to a filter room where information was funneled into central operations. There was no official start to the Battle of Britain, but when Hitler's Luftwaffe struck out across the channel in August 1940, the British control and command system was ready. Chain home was about to be put to the test. We have only been used to dealing with about 12 aircraft at a time the most. And you've got this great big mass on your screen. We had to guess how many there were there. The Royal Air Force could see the Germans when they were coming. They could keep their planes on the ground, not waste fuel. And then they could be directed to exactly where they needed to be. German fighters, on the other hand, were forced to engage over enemy territory, often at the limit of their fuel reserves. Facing heavy losses, the Luftwaffe made it a priority to take out the British early warning system. The Nazi bombers targeted the radar installations. Luftwaffe destroyed a station. The British had backup portable units that they immediately brought in as replacements. After we were bombed, we couldn't operate. We uh, then went into the woods at a mobile set. A large caravan with the receiver in, and the other caravan with the transmitter. And if we hadn't got those, there'd, there'd have been a great gap. So uh, they didn't put us out of action. That was the strength of the chain home system. The Germans couldn't knock it out. So on September 7, 1940, Hitler changed tactics and focused his strikes on London itself. The British stood virtually alone against the German assault. 
world was now at war on a scale never before imagined. As the Allies joined forces against common enemies in Europe and the Pacific, one weapon topped their wish list. A weapon that could carry the fight to the enemy, inflict heavy damage, and return. They needed a strategic bomber, and the technology now existed to create one. Stronger airframes with improved aerodynamics meant warplanes could carry previously impossible loads. Radio communications meant bombers could operate in fleets, forming great armadas in the sky. And improved aiming devices meant they actually had a chance of hitting their targets. The first daylight strategic bomber to enter the fray was the U.S. Army's B-17, the Flying Fortress. You didn't have to know anything about airplanes to ha have the wow factor. Four engines could fly at a ceiling of 38,000 feet, 300 miles per hour, multi-thousand mile range. It symbolized this whole idea of air power. The B-17 was flown by both the U.S. Army Air Force and the RAF. It was a massive, complex machine with a crew of 10 men. In addition to the pilots, there was a flight engineer, navigator, bombardier, radio operator, and four gunners. Each plane was just one small part of a much larger system. 18 to 21 bombers formed an aerial combat box, which, when combined with two other boxes, formed a combat wing of up to 63 planes. The formations were designed to provide the greatest overall coverage against enemy fire. Dropping massive barrages of incendiaries and high explosives onto German towns. They carried out their raids at night using Lancaster heavy bombers. The goal? To overwhelm the enemy's defenses with sustained and relentless onslaughts. The U.S. used precision by day the RAF employed quantity by night. The objective was to put 30 bombers a minute over the target, so the defenses were swamped by this concentration. Such ambition required an unprecedented number of bombers. The bombers flew in a main force stream which usually was 4,000 feet deep in height. And if there were a 1,000 bombers in the raid, the length of the bomber stream could be as long as 100 miles. But for these armadas to be effective at night, they needed a target finder, a sturdy, fast plane that could see in the dark and guide them to their bomb drops with illuminated flares. A unique marriage of radio navigation technology, low-tech materials, and genius design would prove to be the answer. It was called the Oboe Mosquito. The Mosquito literally flew in the face of convention. It was unlike any other plane of World War II. At a time when raw materials, manpower, and skilled mechanics were almost impossible to come by, designers at the de Havilland Aircraft Company came up with the idea of building the fastest fighter bomber in the world using furniture makers, women. But the wooden design was stronger than it looked. The single laminated wing was sturdy enough to hold two massive 1,600 horsepower Rolls-Royce engines making the Mosquito the fastest, most fuel-efficient plane in its class. This was a plane fast enough to evade German fighters and robust enough to carry a heavy payload of bombs and flares. But it still needed a means of navigating to its target. For this, the RAF first looked to a system used by the heavy bombers, a system known as G. The G set was perhaps the navigator's most important aid. G worked off a chart that corresponded to a series of UK-based radio signals. 
What we're trying to do is measure the time difference between the arrival of two pulses transmitted from two stations in the UK. There's one located at the focus of this hyperbola, there's another one at the focus of this hyperbola. If you receive the signals exactly at the same time, you would be on a line that intercepts the two stations. If you receive the signals at a later time or an earlier time, then you'll be on another line that is either this or this side of the transmitter. Using two sets of lines, where those lines intercept, that will be your position. The G system gave bomber crews a useful navigation tool, but its accuracy diminished over distance, so it was almost useless for targets far from the coastline. When you went over to the French coast, the accuracy might drop to one mile. Nearer to Germany would perhaps fall to two miles. And when you got deeper into Germany, you might get a fix with an accuracy of five miles if you were lucky. G was effective for general navigation by the vast fleets of British planes. But the Mosquitoes needed something far more accurate if they were to lead the armadas to their targets. So the RAF tried a system that dedicated two separated radar stations to a single aircraft. One station was for tracking, the other for bomb release. By following the signal from the tracking station, the plane would fly towards the predetermined target. When it intersected the signal from the release station, the pilot knew he was over the target and the colored flares were released. Codenamed Obo, for the sound the two signals made when they met, the system proved ideal for the Mosquito's role as a pathfinder. With the Mosquitoes guiding the way and marking targets with different colored flares, the huge Allied armadas began to turn the tide of the war in Europe. Line bombing, as it was called, was learning to see quite well. By late 43, early 44, Bomber Command could bomb more accurately by night than the U.S. Army Air Force could by day because of Obo and G. Effective bombing at night had become a reality in Europe because the bombers were part of an integrated system. Interlocking technologies were providing the key to air power. The war America was fighting in the Pacific required even more collaboration. Here, the synchronization of air, sea, and land forces was the only option for defeating an enemy spread out over such vast expanses of open ocean. Japan was so far away, it could only be hit from the air. But such long-range attacks required copious resources, bases, airstrips, ammunition, and fuel supplies. They also needed planes that were powerful and fuel efficient enough to cover the huge distances. The B-17s were proving effective in Europe, but here, something bigger and better was needed. The answer was the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress. The B-29 was almost twice the B-17, any way you cared to measure it. It had about twice the payload, twice the horsepower of the engines, twice the range. It was one of these technological milestones that so perfectly represented what it was. In 1944, the only way U.S. bombers could reach Japan was via improvised airstrips on mainland China. They, in turn, could only be approached via bases in India. That meant crossing back and forth over the high Himalayas. That was the B-29's run. And since the air at the roof of the world was thin and cold, the B-29 would be the first pressurized warplane. The pressurized sections were heated and connected by a system of tunnels. For the first time in almost 40 years of military aviation, the crews could come in from the cold. On June 5, 1944, 
the B-29s flew their first combat mission. Armed with Norton bomb sites, they were at last within striking distance of Japan. But the high altitude planes ran into an unexpected problem. The jet stream over the Pacific was so strong that if you came into the jet stream over a Japanese target, you were practically standing still. And if you flew over the target with the jet stream, you were jetting across so that you, you just couldn't hit anything. At 30,000 feet, the B-29s could reach Japan. They just couldn't hit it. In July 1944, Bomber Command was handed over to General Curtis LeMay. Fresh from the European campaign, LeMay switched to a more familiar strategy. Curtis LeMay says, to hell with all this foolishness. Take the defensive armament out of the B-29, except for the tail turret. Get rid of all the pressurized systems. We are going over Japan at low level, at night, with incendiaries, and we're going to burn those cities to the ground. The shift in strategy worked the stripped down but heavily loaded B-29s became a devastating weapon. At the lower altitudes, they would hang as many firebombs as they could on the racks, and then they laid them up in there even. And uh, when the bomb bay doors come closed, there was just about that much room. As island after island fell to U.S. forces, the bombers closed the net on Japan. Desperate to end the war, LeMay had no qualms about rejecting the American philosophy of precision bombing in favor of the low-level carpet bombing approach of the British. On one night alone, 853 B-29s bombed Japanese cities. But despite the endless barrage, the Japanese refused to surrender. So the U.S. advanced another plan, one that would change the rules of war forever. On the morning of August 6, 1945, the B-29 was given a new mission, one that it alone could fulfill. The world's biggest bomber would carry the world's first nuclear bomb. The B-29 program was more complex and more technically demanding than even developing the atomic bomb. We talk about systems. The atomic bomb wouldn't have been anything without the B-29. Aviation in World War II had been about radar and bombers. It ended with the bomb. What began with the arrival of air power was now foreshadowing the threat of total air supremacy. By 1945, the world's leading nations all had air forces. Planes with integrated systems flying in integrated formations. Radar was rapidly becoming a worldwide network. And because of aviation, the global combat arena was shrinking. At Hiroshima, a single plane delivered one terrifying message. No place on Earth was safe from the warplane. 